Roundtable and the Lab of the Future. My name is Joanne Gear, and I am the Executive Director for the Westchester Biotech Project. Uh, I'm going to be introducing my partner in a moment, uh, but I just want to welcome everyone. It's wonderful to be gathering. I'm so appreciative of our speakers today. Obviously, it's a really key topic. Uh, if you are not speaking, please make sure that you are muted because we have, we have a lot of people on the call today. Um, Michael Welling, would you like to introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about us? Absolutely. Thank you, Joanne. And good morning, everyone. First of all, I hope all of you are safe and comfortable and, and healthy wherever you are uh, and I'm sure adapting to the new normal as we approach both the Passover and the Easter holidays. So uh, sending warm regards to everyone who is celebrating. Uh, we are really appreciative of the opportunity to have this uh, conversation today um, from Dr. Hillier and, and our friend uh, Reza to talk a little bit about both a topic that is, is couldn't be more uh, appropriate, but also I think is part of a new conversation as we look forward to, to how we proceed. Uh, but for those of you who are, are new to our community here, again, welcome, old friends and new. Uh, the Westchester Biotech Project, we are a, uh, a, a nonprofit organization that was started, I, I think next month is our fourth or fifth anniversary. I've, I've lost track, Joanne. It feels like 50 years. Uh, and that's a compliment, not, not an insult. Um, but we have sort of launched with the mission of connecting people and science and business and, and just providing a platform for collaboration. And we are honored and humbled and proud of the work that we have accomplished, the people uh, that we have brought together. And really, more than anything, it's not an attribute to us. It's a tribute to all of you for seeing the opportunity, recognizing the value of this collaboration. Uh, and, and we know that many of the great things we have accomplished and will accomplish are again, a direct result of all of your contributions and input and participation. Uh, we have a few key sort of dots as we are calling them because we see our role in all of this uh, as trying to connect the dots. And what you see in front of you uh, is a representation of some of our key uh, uh, initiatives and, and core mission. And I just want to talk two seconds on each one of these um, just to give you a sense. So first you see upper left-hand corner, the Westchester Blueprint 2030. Uh, this is an initiative that we've undertaken to uh, connect and bring together all aspects of the scientific business, municipality, government, nonprofit, for-profit community to talk about how do we build a Westchester that is designed and geared to support uh, the biotech community of the future. And then that is something that uh, we've got a lot of people in the boat rowing together and, and we welcome anyone to, to sort of join us in those efforts. Below that, you see our international data hub. This is something that we are uh, also very excited about in, in concert with our good friend, uh, Paul Savage, who's on the call. Uh, looking for a way to build the infrastructure, both literally uh, for Westchester to be home to an international data analytics initiative. Uh, we've got some really fascinating people uh, around the table, some really cool uh, sort of cutting edge ways of looking, accessing, and analyzing data. Uh, and again, something that if that is of interest to anyone, we, we strongly encourage you uh, to join us and, and, and lend your voice to our efforts. Um, middle, bottom, it kind of feels like I'm playing Hollywood Squares here. I'll take Career Consortium in the middle for the win, Alex. Uh, Career Consortium is our initiative to sort of engage the education, academic, and sort of for-profit community from K to Gray is our good friend, Carla Romney, who heads up a lot of our education strategy, talks about uh, working through our uh, certificate program for lab uh, 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 literacy skills uh, and programs in the classroom and outside the classroom to help not only help people get to the bench, but stay there as well. Uh, the lab to market, building the cluster, connecting community, again, those are our sort of mission and the areas in which we look to engage everyone in all of our initiatives. Uh, a big shout out to our, our friends at JP Morgan Biomed Realty, 
Ontario Language Services, Lyra Skanska, and Fordham University in particular, who all came together uh, just over a month ago, February 27th, might as well have been 10 years ago at this stage, for our State of the Healthcare and Biotech Community Breakfast at the Westchester Marriott. We had more than 100 people in attendance. Uh, we had folks from all over the world presenting and engaging. And this was a, a, an exciting and fascinating engagement of bringing the science community together with the business community. Uh, and at least for the way the world looked on February 27th, uh, we were laying out some strategy and some ideas about how to move forward. I think many of those uh, ideas and concepts are still relevant today and obviously uh, some have changed. And, and again, our, our program today will talk about some of the things that have changed there. Uh, but we thank all of our partners uh, across the board, uh, Biomed Realty, CBRE, uh, who have taken on the initiative of sort of leading the way here in Westchester uh, for building out some state-of-the-art wet lab space uh, at Ardsley Park. You see a little bit of a, a rendering there. We believe that they have really been trendsetters in helping move our community forward and providing this physical infrastructure for our community. I think it's important to note, just for those of you who are new to our community, uh, a quick backstory about the name of our organization. So the Westchester Biotech Project. As many of you uh, may have heard me say, I've been asked in the past, why do you have Westchester in the name of your organization? Doesn't that limit you to just people in Westchester? And it's just the opposite, actually. We have Westchester in our name because we're trying to shine a light on all of the great work that's being done in Westchester for the purpose of connecting them with people outside Westchester, throughout the state, the region, the country, and the world. So it's not that we're only focused on Westchester, we're focused on building up Westchester. Then I've had some people ask me, why do you have biotech in your name? Isn't that a little limiting? And we sort of clarify that by saying, no, it's bioscience and technology. We cover the entire spectrum from data analytics to frontline patient care and anywhere in between, all are welcome. And then of course, the last question I get is, why do you have project in your name? Doesn't that imply uh, that you know this is gonna have some end date to it? Uh, and as I say, and I've changed this joke recently, when we no longer can get up in the morning and do this, this will be over. But we actually think this will, will live much longer than, than our ability to run it. Uh, but again, the screen here represents many of our partners and supporters with whom out whom without this could not be possible. So we, we thank them, we tip our hat to them and encourage all of you to, to reach out to any of them should they have some service or opportunity that might be of value to you. And we're always welcome to make those introductions on their behalf as well as on your behalf. Um, our, our, our famous quote that has been uh, sort of altered for, for the new reality. So we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. This has been a tenant of our uh, organization and not being short-sighted and looking long-term and laying the groundwork and doing the hard work to lay the groundwork for future success. And, and we credit our, our good friend, Paul Savage, for for saying that while some may overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years, right now many will overestimate the change that will occur in the next two weeks. So we appreciate uh, his editing of, of our mantra there. Excellent. So now I, I'm excited and proud and honored to turn this over to our, our two main speakers today. Again, Dr. Christopher Hillier from the New York Blood Center, who we appreciate just from the bottom of our hearts taking time away from from his frontline work to, to participate with us today and our good friend uh an architect of labs of yesterday today and the future uh reza again and i will turn it over to you now hi this is joanne gear again i'm just going to say a few words before we go forward uh, you're on, on deck there, Chris. We'll be starting with just a moment. Uh, so I'm Joanne Gear. I'm the Executive Director for Westchester Biotech Project, and uh, I agree loudly with everything Michael had to say. i just like to share it uh, to be sure. It looks like people are doing quite well. Please be sure that you are muted unless you are talking. We are going to hear from our speakers, and then we're going to have a round table. Uh, we have a very large group today, so uh, usually I go around the call and almost try to force people to speak up. But today I'm going to ask you when we get to the round table, if you would um, 
uh, send send me a note through the chat that you'd like to speak, and then we'll call on you and invite you to ask questions, talk about what your work is, what how it all resonates for you, and so on. And Bob Green, I'm I'm putting you on notice. I'm going to call on you first. So we'll, we'll when we get there, it'll be your turn to start. Um, all right, I'll start thinking about it. Thank you. There you go. I wanted to give you a little time to get prepared. Um, so, Chris, uh, would you like to say anything about yourself to get started? Well, good morning, or I guess it's even afternoon. I don't even know what time it is anymore. <laughs> the way we've been going. So, <clears throat> well, good day, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks to Joanne and Michael for the invitation. Um, originally, when we had uh, planned out our agenda for this, we wanted to talk about high-rise lab buildings in Westchester and the, the New York area, and it's morphed dramatically over the last few weeks into a little bit more COVID-centric. So if you just flip up the slides, I'll walk through them and uh, try and spend about 20 minutes giving you some idea about New York Blood Center, what we're doing, our COVID research, as well as why we're building the buildings and where we're building and what we're trying to do. Uh, next slide. So while it says I'm president and uh, CEO of New York Blood Center, I've been a hematologist for uh, a long, long time and really a virologist has been most of my research work, the hematologic aspects of the viral infections. And that placed us in a pretty good uh, place for all of transfusion transplantation medicine, which is uh, really critical not to transfuse viruses. And we have been working on SARS, and so it made a lot of sense to work, and we could work very quickly on COVID. So the Blood Center started in 1963. It's called New York Blood Center, and it has now become Enterprises because we've basically been gone national. Mission-driven 501c3 company that provides blood cord, blood stem cells, as you can see on the screen, biologics, et cetera, and uh, research in regenerative medicine applications across the world. Uh, but we are a unique blood center in that we house a couple of translational research institutes, the oldest uh, public core blank, an upper east side applied accelerator program where we have eight companies in the building that all uh, can interact with us. And we have advanced core facilities, which we'll be talking a little bit about today, <clears throat> and then training and community programs. So it's on that background that we realized our building next slide was getting a little too old. Um, but I just thought I'd show you, which I don't always do, a map of, you know, sort of where we interdigitate with the country. And, and this is critical right now because we are launching, have launched a big convalescent plasma program for COVID infections. And uh, really, we need to be able to provide product through the rest of the country, which won't be difficult. And that's recovered patients who have recovered, their plasma can be used. And we'll talk about that in a second, but we're gonna have the biggest wave of recovered people here uh, in New York in the tri-state area. Next slide. So it is a unique blood center with a focus on R&D. Uh, in the 1970s, we looked at hepatitis, and I'll move through this list quickly. These are the sort of big achievement ones. Solvent detergent plasma was, manu was uh, manufactured by us in order to create safe transfusion products that could remove viruses. We had one of the first HIV drugs, so the first public core banks. We cloned a bunch of blood group antigens and, and things like that. But I threw on the bottom, well, I guess the third from the bottom is we were the first uh, company to produce a licensed stem cell product through the FDA. And then we've been working on prototype vaccine development. And I'll talk a little bit about some of these because of our BSL-3 and our enhanced BSL-3 work. And then the convalescent uh, plasma program, which we really started for Ebola. Uh, and then COVID-19. Next slide. So since they asked me to focus a little bit on SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus, rather than the COVID, which is the disease, <clears throat> uh, I thought I'd throw out SARS-CoV-2 and also ASFV. Uh, that's African swine fever virus. Now, this is a building developer architect talk, not a virus talk, so perhaps no one's interested in it, but this is a matter of national security. It, about uh, it was August of 18, a huge uh, epidemic of this African swine fever virus hit hogs uh, and pork manufacturers in China, which has 2 billion pigs. Uh, they have culled half of their herds, so 1 billion pigs. And all of the conferences <clears throat> that related to pork in the United States and around the world were canceled because there was, so, there was such a big worry that this virus would come. Uh, to the United States. So it's a matter of national security. It's a matter of the economy. And interestingly enough, it had people in a panic until COVID. 
Um, so we, we decided, even though we're a blood center for humans, that we had all of the tools to make novel vaccines. And so we started on the ASFV. And the reason that's important is because the building's critical in terms of security and ventilation and all sorts of things. I threw in there our, uh, an article of, from our lab on neutralizing antibodies in SARS-CoV just so people would have it up here in Cell Press 2020. That is the biologic basis for how vaccines are made against uh, SARS-CoV. It's kind of interesting. The next big program we launched was convalescent plasma. So people who recover from COVID infection have antibodies. If you infuse those antibodies into patients who are just getting the virus, they coat the virus. The virus can then be remo removed by the immune system without the immune system having to build its own amount of antibodies, which always happens over uh, 21 to 20, uh, 14 to 21 days. But if we infuse these uh, antibodies in plasma from COVID survivors, they last for a month and help uh, the person weather the initial attacks of the infection. We're very hopeful that that's a promising new therapy. And we put together, we, I don't know, we must have eight or 10 studies right now, but we have two novel tests. One is to, to determine the antibody so that when people are immune, we can put the nation back to work. And then the other one is prognosticating severity. You know, this idea that men are at greatest risk. This morning's news has African-Americans uh, dying at a much higher percentage and rate and, and talking about health disparities. While health and access disparities are extremely important, healthcare disparities, the question I had first is, is there a medical basis for it? And I think there might be. Next slide. So we decided to look at our core competencies and, just, and, and our building. We have an acre of land on between 66th Street and 67th Street on the Upper East Side. We decided uh, we wanted to be bigger, which meant getting taller. And getting taller leads to finding developers and really trying to figure out um, how to build a, a better building. And since I'm not a builder and Bob Green's on the phone and Reza, um, who, who works, has been working with me and us for decades, uh, we looked at our, at our ability in cell-based therapeutics and donor selection, collection, manufacturing, testing, storage of cells in a highly regulated, regulated environment and our R&D technologies in hematology, virology, immunology and others. And we tried to put this together and say, how can we make a, a, an ecosystem that would allow for the training of young people? Really talk about what Michael said in the Westchester Biotech Project. Uh, to bring everyone together, not just in and around New York City, but in, in Westchester as well, where I am right now, and uh, and well beyond. Next slide, please, Joanne. So we wanted to be part of the, of this is the old version. It says the New York City Biotech Build, but I really meant to write New York State um, Biotech Build because there's this huge need for wet labs. And you saw with uh, the Ardsley Park uh, and, and what Regeneron is doing, all of the growth in these, these major high-end, high-tech, superstar, high-IQ uh, companies. And so we created a mission to bring investigators, institutions, foundations, companies, and investors together, sounded just like what Michael said, support, lead, and advance the IP to commercialization to really go out and be able to help patients create companies, retain human investment capital, and create jobs uh, in the state and the city. And we chose as a programmatic focus our biologic space therapy because that's what we do in regenerative medicine, cell and plasma-based products, tissue engineering, vaccines, small molecules, et cetera. So just like Michael said about the biotech project, maybe it doesn't have everything in its bioscience and technology. We have a lot all in the biotech. And you'll see in that middle logo there, the life sciences, uh, New York had new discoveries, new jobs, and, and it's been looking to name a specific hub or multiple hubs. Uh, within the boroughs to create this kind of biotech. Next slide. So outdated buildings, we're here to talk about buildings. We have isolated labs that were built uh, for pre-molecular, pre-gene editing, uh, pre the cells as drugs world. We have lots more chemical fume hood than we need, but we don't have CGMP, which stands for current good manufacturing practices, probably no labs and manufacturing space and the ability to scale up. We have a lot of non-productive square feet uh, in large hallways and uh, poorly sized and outdated common interaction spaces, as it says. Lack of amenities for the work till you drop scientists, which at the moment we're all uh, working till we drop. Uh, and then there weren't enough core facilities to support all the companies that want to come in. And we 
basically have companies knocking down our doors to, to come in at all uh, stages. And then there's a whole bunch of complexities that I think uh, Reza will talk to, the problematic wastewater and exhaust air. And of course, what we produce is chemically uh, questionable viral and potentially toxic and we want to make sure that we're within code and, and and dealing with all the air handling for very tall building of FAR of say 10 floors of say call it 18 to 20. So highly specialized facilities we need uh, biosafety level laboratory three uh, facilities and uh, essentially this is where you can use highly uh, dangerous pathogens without having to go into a complete suit with oxygen and we are moving our BSL-3 to a thing called an enhanced BL3, BSL-3 so that we can deal directly with COVID and uh, ASV and H1N1 flu. There, we require specialized fire suppression systems and the whole concept was we needed to do all this and provide amenities and have it be within walking distance of our collaborator companies and, and people at hospitals and institutions. Next slide. And here, okay, so, um, <clears throat> the lab equipment and animal challenges in a high rise, high R&D risk, high risk lab building has to do with diversity of lab types, but also vibration as you go up, noise, light, exhaust, security, and fire suppression. And the next slide shows um, about a billion dollars worth of cord blood inventory and robotic freezers uh, with a uh, non-water uh, fire suppression system. So these these facilities require a lot of specialized building and infrastructure. Uh, that's just to give you an example of what, what it looks like. Next slide. So building the ecosystem with uh, Reza, Eniad, and Longfellow, we have designed a building with the bottom uh, base here will be New York Blood Center with our core labs. It'll serve all of our partners above. And then above will be Longfellow's essentially condominium tower with companies in it in this exact space at a whole range of, of uh, levels from startup to graduation uh, and post IPO. and all of those people can interact through our conference spacing and core labs. And you see um, on the right, the picture on the right, there's a terrace, there's a lot of uh, ability for people to work together. So this is our working concept that we're going through the process uh, to build uh, together. Next slide. And just, uh, it was interesting to Bob and me that in November, SGA un unveiled their approach to a vertical cluster for life science in dense urban environments. And it struck us that it, they, they had come up with virtually the same approach to building these high rise buildings. And, and both of these gentlemen I mentioned will be able to talk much more about the complexities of the building process. Next. So what we did was we built modular labs with uh, the support systems in the center and the open benches across uh, the windows and the edges of it. And these are really two L's that fit together. And this is a conceptual tenant floor plan for floor six to 15. And we could rent out uh, a quarter of it, half of it, the whole of it, or, or, or even connect several of them uh, together. And so it's a modular uh, concept. Next slide. These are all just some renderings of what it could look like. So we can go through this, Joanne, fairly quickly. That re That's a Reza slide. The next one is the notion of really having interactive space and visualization transparency and not big hallways. And then you can see there's comfortable and from the outside, it would kind of have that look. So there's, okay, good. Cost and complexity to all this. There's a cost to build it and cost to, to rent. Uh, of course, it's costly for people to live anywhere in New York, and it's costly for startups to operate. And then there's the complexities of density and movement, height challenges in zoning, the Euler process in the city, building codes, buildings, building itself and codes, and then, of course, talent acquisition, all the regulations that go into this, which I expect most of you are pretty familiar with. Next slide. So COVID, special considerations, you know, we, 
we have been using a COVID pseudovirus. We built a pseudovirus. Essentially, it has a lot of the virus pieces, but it's not infectious. It's not alive. It's a fake virus. But in order to use the live virus, we have to be in an enhanced BSL-3. And there's a tremendous amount of regulation and, and air handling and security. And I put staff safety as a very important issue, obviously, very important always to me as CEO. But it's become a matter of national security and we have to have both building security, special IT codes, and all sorts of things to figure out access. So it's, it's a very high tech uh, type of facility to have. And uh, <clears throat> there really aren't very many animal BSL-3s or, or BSL-3s that are using animal viruses. So I put down, again, African uh, swine fever virus, but COVID falls right in there. And then the building codes and the logic of, of how to do all this. For example, some of the hospitals in New York City in, patient, in COVID patients room decided what they wanted to do was create airflow out of the room, but not into the central building. So they put holes in the windows and, and are starting to pump air out. And so one wonders, you know, just how infectious air, if you will, goes out into the common air and where it goes from there. And our, our roof is already littered at four and a half stories with high stacks to make sure that everything is above uh, and within code. But uh, as we build higher, a lot more lift uh, and air handling and things like that go into it from the mechanical side. Next slide. So I don't know if anyone's interested, but I thought I'd throw in a slide like this, which everyone can look at and say, I really wish I hadn't taken any science classes. But on the upper left is the virus, that round thing binding to the ACE2 and, um, uh, receptor, which is really fascinating that this virus uses that particular receptor. But the thing about this virus that makes it so amazing is this next little square here with this temperous molecule. So there's a an enzyme that creates this spike protein, and that's where it manages to get superfusion and into cells to mediate higher viral entry. And so what's interesting about the ACE receptor, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor, which has to do with, you know, with blood pressure, but it's in the lungs. And so if you wonder why maybe people are getting so much lung pathology that goes along with it, and I'll bore you with one more with my thanks to you, next slide. Uh, which is we immediately started to ask the question why men were doing worse. And so these, this is an impossible slide to read. Um, but what it really says is it looks at the ACE2 um, receptor in all tissues and it shows that you can't see this exactly, but the green bar two thirds of the way to the right, the long green bar up over 500, the mid there is how much of it is that there is in lung but then if you go down and you look at this um, special enzyme that creates the huge pathology on the very left has that big spike is prostate. And so prostate is only found in men and African-Americans have more prostate cancer. So do those things go together? We have no idea at present, but those are the kind of things that we look at. And so we need high um, kind of high IQ people in the building and then a high tech building to support the work. Next slide. So I'll just finish up very quickly by saying, you know, we hope that we will be named as one of the life sciences hub. We have uh, put out um, with the EDC and Longfellow this notion of how we would become part of an anchoring R&D Institute. The three circles are the institutional partners. On the right is the capital and strategic partners. On the bottom, it says, this is from the government, um, the, from the city. It says, uh, seasoned R&D leadership and world-class mission. That's supposed to be us. I wouldn't uh, put those names on, on, on us all the time. But where all the Venn diagrams come together are these things that we think of as moonshot projects that can really help move health and humanity forward. And, and we really, really, really need that kind of um, working together like the Westchester Biotech Project brings together so that we can solve things like COVID. Next slide. Last slide. I think we want to build the, we want to be part of the New York City's life science ecosystem. We want to be part of New York State and Westchester's ecosystem. Um, and we're right now calling this building Center East. It's great science, great people, great partnerships, great location. Sounds like an ad. It is. Um, mm -hmm. But we're really, uh, we're really thrilled. We're a very collaborative environment. And we sound a lot like Michael said in his introduction that we would 
uh, we look to have people come together all the time. And I'm always looking for people that are smarter and faster than I am and we are so that we can build things even better. So with that, Joanne, I'll say thank you at 19 minutes and 36 seconds. How about that? Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, Reza, I'm going to make you the presenter. Thank you. And you can take over. Okay, right. here it goes. You should have a little pop-up that invites you to become the presenter. There you go. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much. Um, Reza Gayan, I'm the president of Research and Academic Architecture. We are an architectural firm who designs and builds laboratories and healthcare facilities and commercial buildings. We're located, our main office is in White Plains, New York, and we have um, offices in San Francisco, LA, and our affiliated office in Atlanta, Georgia. Our experience extends from doing laboratories, as Dr. Herrier was mentioning before, for institutions such as NYBC, universities nationwide, and um, you know, uh, commercial entities from Canada to Kuwait. So we have done a number of uh, international projects also. We also do commercial buildings, such as um, studios for companies such as NBC. We just finished a 70,000 square feet uh, office and studio facility for them in Long Island City. Um, today's presentation really is about uh, yeah. Today's presentation is actually about the transformation of an existing BSL-3 lab in near a blood center to a BSL-3 enhanced laboratory for coronavirus research. The uh, BSL-3 lab was built years ago according to the guidelines of CDC NIH as outlined in the um, Biosafety in Microbial and Biomedical Laboratories by CDC. In that, uh, CDC defines biosafety as the application of safety and safety precautions that reduces a technician's risk of exposure to potentially infectious microbes and also limits uh, contamination of the work environment and ultimately the community. So um, CDC basically is talking about reducing the risk or limiting the contamination in these facilities and not completely eliminating them. And there are actually two um, sets of guidelines. One are for practices and the other one is for the building of these facilities. And the combination of the two um, basically gives a facility that uh, would secure um, safety for the people who work there and also for the, for the entire neighborhood. Amongst them, of course, are um, controlled access, which goes beyond just the um, doors and the um, access to the physical lab, but it also, for example, contains working with um, SRA, which is Security Risk Assessment um, Procedure, which is a method that was actually developed by FDI and is conducted for all people and all the staff who are working at the BSL-3 facility. Um, and the, the facility itself, then CDC has a number of guidelines such as self-closing lab doors and also things like um, epoxy paint that's being applied on all walls and ceilings in order to make them um, you know, cleanable surfaces. And the flooring is, uh, for example, welded sheet vinyl with integral base. The light fixtures are all sealable, all cavities in and around the inside. And inside, the electrical and data outlets are all sealed so that uh, it's easy to clean it and also nothing leaks from the space out. There is also a negative airflow in the lab, which I'll go into more detail as, uh, as we talk about the uh, enhanced BSL-3 lab. Some of the question came up when the question came to change the laboratory and starts looking at the, uh, uh, the enhanced facility that would replace the existing uh, BSL-3 lab. Um, I must first say that the contractor who helps in uh, building this was Caldwell and Walsh and they did a great job. Um, rodents became a part of the research and other federal governing agencies, they became involved. Um, for example, APHIS 
became involved because APHIS, which is a department within USDA, regulates pathogens that have impact on countries' plant and livestock resources, including HPAI, which is the highly pathogenic avian influenza. Not to mention, since now animals are involved, not to mention all the other agencies that uh, we had to look into, or Blood Center, in fact, had to look into, and we had to help and work with them, or NIH OLA, which is NIH Office of Lab Animal Welfare, ALAC, which is the Association for Assessment and Accreditation of Lab Animal Care, and um, other agencies. In the process of doing this um, design of this um, BSL-3 enhanced facility, APHIS then well, has some guidelines as far as downing in and showering out, which then created a um, directional movement of people inside the lab space. Um, USDA has, has also a number of um, guidelines as far as unlocking doors. And um, at any given time, one door uh, can be open. And, and, and uh, the round mustard um, shape that you are showing on this drawing, it indicates the iris recognition device that uh, opens the door upon approval. So we have the three interlocking doors at the vestibule, and they only can have two interlocking doors. At any given time, the doors to the lab can be, uh, can be functioning. The facility has an independent air supply and two exhaust fans um, for this um, BSL-3 enhanced uh, um, building, or I, I should say the facility. All three units are interconnected. The exhaust fans are an emergency power in case of power failure. When supply shuts down, the HEPA filter, the exhaust will run in a lower speed to allow the doors to open. Air flows from the least contaminated area to the most contaminated area. And uh, the drawings shows the negatives, which are the uh, where the exhaust is more than the supply, and the highest exhaust is within the biosafety cabinet, which leads us to the um, next one, which has to do with the uh, um, autoclave and where all the decontamination in the lab occurs. The auto uh, autoclave and the other um, equipment, main equipment in the lab, will also supplied by Eris, uh, which is Eris Scientific, uh, by Drew, Drew Kevorkian, and he did a great job in terms of doing the coordination on all these uh, elements. We, um, here we have a um, um, enhanced, uh, well, the autoclave itself basically has these um, various features. One of them is the uh, bioseal feature, and in that, it, it helps to completely seal the, uh, the, the uh, space around the autoclave so that no air can go from the lab outside to the vestibule. And this is done by creating a stainless steel um, plate that's continuously welded to the four sides of the autoclave. And there is a silicon gasket between that and the rest of the opening, sealing it completely. A smoke test was uh, conducted to assure that the uh, integrity of the seal was confirmed. There is also an effluent decontamination because the, uh, as the sterilizer is loaded with uh, contaminated go goods and the door is closed, the first air that's there will be vacuumed out of it and is purged out of the chamber. And that air is contaminated. So in order to make sure that that uh, contaminated air never gets out, there are multiple solutions, and we went with the first one, which was the internal HEPA filter. And uh, that internal HEPA filter, which is within the chamber, it will basically HEPA filter all that air before, before it releases it out to the outside. Uh, there are other solutions. One was the external HEPA filter, and the last one was the decon tank. The decon tank is more costly, and it requires a lot more space but it is worthwhile if the facility was bigger and had more showers. Uh, the external have a filter, the problem with that would be that uh, you would have only technicians who know, who have expertise in changing could do that. The current solution, which is an internal HEPA filter, uh, can be changed by anyone 
who's working there because it doesn't require any specific uh, knowledge in terms of what they uh, are doing because it's within the chamber and it's all been sterilized. And the, the, uh, that uh, unit is clean in and of itself when they get to it. The biosafety cabinet is a class 2A2 and it's uh, all built by uh, the guidelines as given by NSF 49, a National uh, Sanitation Foundation. And um, the purpose of this biosafety cabinet is to protect both the person who's the working at the biosafety cabinet and also protect the product that's inside the, uh, the cabinet. There is a plenum with a fan in it that uh, creates a um, 150 uh, feet per minute um, pressure, negative pressure inside the chamber. And the air inside the chamber is then pulled through a HEPA filter. 70% of that is um, reused in, inside the um, chamber and 30% of it is being um, exhausted out to the building exhaust, which also has HEPA filter. And in case of um, failure of that exhaust, the unit will not stop working and it will actually open up a flip, which is in the uh, thermal connection and would blow the air out to the lab away from the person who's working there. But this still um, will continue HEPA filtering the, the product and will continue um, protecting the person who's working there. Animal caging system has a HEPA filter to supply and exhaust air. All of these are again required by APHIS and USDA and the, um, and the uh, animal caging does accommodate that. Um, when a cage is removed from the rack, both the cage and the rack are sealed from the room uh, through disconnects. The decontamination of the lab will occur annually and uh, there were multiple chemicals that were, that were discussed and looked upon, such as uh, hydrogen peroxide, formaldehyde, chlorine. I think the final system was a halo system, which was, uh, creates a mist and once the room is sealed, it will run for, for a number of hours and will completely decontaminate the space. In the last slide, I would like to say that this process of going through all these multiple agencies, and there were many federal agencies that we had to go through, and was we were only able, able to do that and work together with Blood Center because the Blood Center had uh, multiple com committees looking at this. One of them was IBC, which is the Institutional Biosafety Committee, which was responsible for reviewing and approving practices and protocols for handling of recombinant DNA and potentially biohazard materials at all research facilities at, at New York Blood Center. And it followed the guidelines of um, Health and Human Services, NIH, CDC, USDA, APHIS, and OSHA. For the animal care, it, there was another committee, Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, IACUC, IACUC and um, Blood Center, which also took um, basically went through and contacted the various agencies and made sure that everything was um, according to the requirements by the federal agencies. And by this, this was the last slide. I'll pass it on to Joanna. Well, thank you, Reza, and thank you, Chris.